The Overlight, we called it. And it is by its colored rays you will know your power, O Skyborn Child. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. Let's talk about Renegade Studios. Having kept a passive eye on this company, it's amusing to see them move up from where they were a few years ago. Nowadays, they've taken the reins of World of Darkness's relaunch after the many, many, many controversies with Onyx Path and Paradox, especially everything that happened with Vampire in the last few years, as well as being the tabletop gaming arm of Hasbro. Renegade had humbler beginnings. I'd first found out about them when it was announced they had reached a deal to do Power Rangers-based tabletop games, arguably one of the few smart decisions to come out of the Neo Saban era. The first big break was the Heroes of the Grid board game. It's a bit unfortunate how that story with Power Rangers eventually culminated, but we've already covered that in my review of the Power Rangers RPG and in the episode of Geek Watch attempting to reconstruct it. Despite that, their Essence 20 system was not their first rodeo in the world of role-playing games. Having handled the publishing of games like Kids on Bikes, Outbreak Undead, Wardlings, and Altered Carbon, the latter of which I hope to visit sometime in the future. I bring all these up to demonstrate that despite how very harsh I was and still am on the Essence 20 games, Renegade doesn't suffer from a lack of talent, which made the Essence 20 thing all the more infuriating. But for this week, I want to tackle what was their first entry into a full-size role-playing game on their own. One with an emphasis on a colorful design with larger-than-life characters in a gonzo fantasy world. In other words, all the things that get my attention. For this review, we'll be tackling their Kaleidoscopic Journeys RPG known as Overlight. Published by Renegade and created by Paul Alexander Butler and George Holland, Overlight describes itself as Kaleidoscopic Fantasy. What exactly does that entail? Well, I'll let them describe it in their own words. Quote, when we think of fantasy, most of us conjure up images of elves, wizards, and dragons. We think of tales strongly rooted in Western folklore and history, or at least in the stories of J.R.R. Tolkien. Dark lords, abandoned underground holds, and bands of heroes questing to foil the schemes of some world-ending evil. Or maybe we think of the gritty, dearth-beneath-your-fingernails fantasy of seminal sword and sorcery author Robert E. Howard, and the new grimdark standard bearers like Joe Abercrombie. A lot of our fantasy role-playing tropes come from these and similar sources. Kaleidoscopic fantasy, a term that we have ourselves created, draws its DNA from some very different places. Most importantly, the aesthetic tone is quite distinctive. Kaleidoscopic fantasy springs from the artwork of such luminaries as Roger Dean, Julie Bell, Mobius, and the early fantasy-themed work of Olivia de Berendinus. Apologies if I mispronounced that. Bright colors, a riotous explosion of life, and fantastic beasts rooted more in the natural world than in nightmarish visions." End quote. But the big question is, how does it hold up in my temple? Let's find out. Overlight runs at 334 pages in a two-column format. While the text is certainly easy on my eyes, I like that there is a watercolor-like aesthetic with the art. It comes off as less like a snapshot of the world and more like a scenery painting you'd see in an art gallery that's trying to capture a moment. I also like that in the chapters discussing the setting itself, there's a first-person perspective, like you're reading someone's account of the world. This is something that I recall seeing in a lot of World of Darkness books back in the day as well. In this regard, Overlight feels more alive than most living campaigns. It's a bit hard to put into words, but it goes back to the style of fantasy they've been trying to achieve. And of course, it has both an index and bookmarks in the PDF version, so solid work all around. Player characters in Overlight are called Skyborn. These are individuals who possess some spark that separates them from the members of their home. This is resolved with a seven-step process, and we'll be exploring it once again with Aldean as a member of the Skyborn Order. I should note that stats are dice-based, in the similar way of games like Savage Worlds and Cortex Prime. The first step is concept, which is self-explanatory if you've seen a narrativist game in the past. It's the come up with an idea for your character phase. Thus, we'll be skipping this part because, well, we already have it. Step two is folk. This is Overlight's equivalent to race. Each folk gains a bonus to virtues, Overlight's version of attributes, skills, and special rules known as gifts. In addition, each folk has a set of associated backgrounds. It's also worth noting that each of the folk is associated with one of the seven virtues and colors. Regardless, there are seven folk to choose from. The Zenith Order monks, who are the humans that operate the monasteries and temples of Zenith, and embody the virtue of wisdom. The Hanamu are an ancient simian-like race, and are often seen as having a bond with these Zenith Order monks. As such, they also embody the virtue of wisdom, but in a different interpretation. The Terixian are an avian race that sees the world as a massive equation, and embody the virtue of logic. 
The Banyari are an insular, mouse-like race that lives among nature, preferring a quiet lifestyle as opposed to the more active ones. The Banyari embody the virtue of compassion. The Harkin are basically the humans of Overlight, but are looked down on by the other folk as city rats. The Harkin embody the virtue of will. The Arumel can be considered a representation of an ancient civilization under their masks. Their craftsmen are masters in their field, but the Arumel can also be seen as decadent. They embody the virtue of vigor. Lastly, the Pyroi are red-skinned humanoid folk that are warriors in some form. This doesn't mean that all Pyroi are fighters, but they treat their actions as fights. In that sense, they embody the virtue of might. Of the available ones, we'll be going with Arumel. This makes our Vigor rating to be D8, and our Craft and Performance ratings to be D6. Step 3 is Background, which can be considered a further starting package for your character. This primarily determines your Wealth rating, Wealth points, Belongings, and Valuables. Additionally, certain Backgrounds may grant a Gift or Skill upgrade. Each folk has a set of associated Backgrounds, and of the available ones for the Arumel, we'll be going with the Merchant Prince. This grants a Persuasion rating of D8, along with the Merchant Prince's belongings and valuables, a Wealth rating of D12, and 20 Wealth points. Step 4 is your Core Virtue. This is the most important of the seven virtues of that character. Now remember how I listed off the associated virtues of the Folk? Well, your Core Virtue can be any one virtue listed, except the one associated with your Chosen Folk. Now once again, the virtues are as follows. Spirit, the White Light and the Power of the Soul. Wisdom, the violet light, the power of experience. Logic, the blue light, the power of reason. Compassion, the green light, the power of connection. Will, the yellow light, the power of the self. Vigor, the orange light, the power of the body. And Might, the red light, the power of force. Since Arumel is our choice of folk, we cannot choose Vigor as our choice here. Instead, we'll be going with Will. This means that when we select Chroma, which I'll get into later, we can only select Chroma from our Core Virtue and our Folk Exclusive Chroma. Step 5 is spending character build points. This is the forefront of character creation. You have 45 build points to spend on Virtues, Skills, and Chroma. Virtues and Skills start at D6 and No Dice, respectively, and Skills cannot be upgraded past D10. Additionally, any leftover build points are converted into Spirit Points, which are used for Chroma. We'll be spending 10 points on two Chroma, Praetorian Swift Blade and Stoic Paragon. For Virtues, we'll spend 6 points on Vigor to bring it up to D10, and 4 points on Will to bring it up to D8. For Skills, we'll spend 4 points each to bring Resolve and Brawl to D8, and 8 points to bring Blades to D10. This leaves us with 9 remaining points, which are converted into our Spirit Pool. Step 6, the final step, is the generation of the Spirit Pool and Health Track. Your initial spirit points are based on your unspent build points, so we have 9 spirit points right out of the gate. The health track is based on one's might rating, plus 4. This means we have 10 squares on our health track. I do like a lot of this character creation system, but I should note it has several of the pitfalls of a point-based system. Point-based can lead to choice paralysis, and as repetitive as it sounds, it is something I will keep bringing up because I keep hearing folk unironically stand point-by systems for providing more freedom without addressing the other half of the matter. In addition, I'm not a fan of spirit being based on unspent build points. I personally think that a baseline would be a much better approach, say, letting everyone get 10 points out of the gate. That may sound like a lot, but spirit is going to go fast, so I don't think this is unbalanced as one might think. Lastly, the backgrounds are going to be a blessing and a curse, since some character ideas might not fit the combination of folk and background. A good GM can work around this, but it is something to consider. Essentially, it's in a middle ground between freeform and structured, and that comes with its own issues. Overlight uses a success-based die pool as its core mechanic. These roles, called tests in the book, operate on a rule of seven kind of system with each of the five tests. Skill, Combat, Open, Chroma, and Wealth. Each test requires a set of three dice from your skill and virtue, although in Wealth checks, your virtue is replaced by, well, Wealth. Regardless, any die that rolls a 6 is a success, and the total successes determine if the action succeeds or fails. One or fewer successes is a failure, two or three is a luminous success, and four or five is a radiant success, along with six being a brilliant success. Respectively, this translates to a fail, obviously, a marginal success, a competent success, and an expert success. For example, let's consider Aldine doing a test with Might and Brawl. 
We take 3d6s for Might and 3d8s for Brawl. Afterwards, any die that's rolled as a 6 is considered a success. That said, there is a 7th die that is rolled, a d4 that is used as the Spirit die. If this die rolls a 4, extra effects may take place, such as adding a point to a Spirit pool, or turning an odd number of successes into the next even number, at the cost of a Spirit point, or turning a Brilliant success into a Legendary success. The other major test with its own rules is the Wealth Test, which is a branch from Skill Tests as money is abstracted in Overlight, i.e. you're not going to see some equivalent to GP. This is resolved like a skill test, but wealth replaces the virtue die as mentioned previously. Additionally, the spirit die determines the number of points spent from one's wealth points in the check. You can potentially still acquire an item on a failed wealth check, but you would instead pay double the number rolled in the spirit die. Now combat works similarly to the core die mechanic, just with each success translating into one point of damage, and the Spirit die instead grants one point into the Fury Pool. The Fury Pool is a secondary Spirit Pool that can be used in lieu of Spirit Points, but only if the Might Virtue is involved. This can be used with both Chroma and with Combat Maneuvers. I should note that when it comes to health, certain boxes are red instead of white. These represent dramatic wounds, more lasting injuries than a mere scratch. Unlike regular wounds which can be healed during a rest, dramatic wounds can only be healed at the end of a scene. Now the only problem I really have with combat is the lack of a static defense or an ability to mitigate successes without paying a cost. I know that Overlight wants combat to be a quick affair, but this could easily be solved by making rolls an XY affair. It's been done before. But before we wrap up, I think it's high time we talk about the powers that the Skyborn utilize. So let's talk a bit about Chroma. Within the world of Zenith, the Overlight is a unifying force that passes through the energies and spirits of Skyborn. This is manipulated in all manner of effects, called Chroma. It's worth noting that the way the effect manifests is determined by the individual Skyborn. Using Chroma is called channeling, and this is done through a Chroma test. The dice pool is created using three dice from each of the two virtues associated with that Chroma, alongside the Spirit die. Now this die is resolved like a skill test, just with two virtues instead of a virtue and a skill, obviously. Much like a wealth test, the Spirit die determines the cost of using a Chroma. However, if the cost to use the Chrome would be more than the Spirit Points you have, you experience a detrimental effect known as a Shatter. This is a set of cumulative, narrative, and mechanical effects that alter something about the character in a permanent sense. For example, let's look at one of Aldine's Chroma, Praetorian Swift Blade, a Vigor and Might Chroma exclusive to the Arumel. This Chroma can be channeled during attacks or when using the Mighty Blow maneuver. Now, a Luminous Success allows her to spend one less Spirit Point when performing Mighty Blow. At Radiant, she also gains Fury Points equal to the Spirit Die result. And at Brilliant, the costs of Rally Comrades and Challenge Foe Maneuvers are reduced by one as well. On the other hand, its first Shatter would place the mark of the Elect Smi on the back of her neck, causing her to choose the path of Hero or Villain. The second Shatter would cause her to take an Idealized Aspect associated with either a Hero or a Villain, and the third Shatter would charge her with the fulfillment of a prophecy. Lastly, there's a subset of Chroma called Luminous. These are special Chroma that create artifacts called Luminon, and are marked with an asterisk in the book. Learning a Luminon costs 7 XP after character creation, and when it is your first channeled, you are creating the associated item. This costs 2 XP and requires you to have at least 4 points in your spirit pool, as you cannot shatter using this type of Chroma. That said, the degree of success may alter the XP cost of creating the Luminon. On a Radiant Success, you only spend 1 XP. On a Brilliant Success, you only spend 1 XP and add the Spirit Die result to the Luminon's Point Bank. What is a Point Bank? Think of it as an item-specific XP pool, which determines what abilities the Luminon can use, provided the Point Bank is at specific values. Some of them have a threshold approach, some of them use it as a resource. It depends on which one you're going with. For example, let's look at the Gambler's Stone Chroma, which uses logic twice for its virtues. With this item, you may add to the point bank by removing a die from a non-chroma test, though only one die may be removed per test. At 1 to 2 points banked, you may replace a die on a non-chroma test with a D8. At 3 to 5, this becomes a D10, and at 6 or higher, a D12. Regardless, after using the effect, the point bank resets to 0. Bear in mind, again, that every Luminous Chroma operates on different rules regarding the point bank and thresholds. There's a lot to like with Overlight, and so much of this game's design screams potential for storytelling in multiple angles. 
Where I feel it struggles is in the little things, such as the aforementioned choice paralysis, as well as the lack of a passive defense in combat. I do think some might take issue with the lack of situational modifiers as well, since I could see the argument being made that roles start to feel a bit samey. Personally, I think most of my issues are with things where I have to wonder how this matches the design goals of the game. In addition, I think it was a mistake to not have some sort of codified equipment list. I'm not saying have a weapon and armor list, but something to give ideas on possessions and valuables that could be acquired through wealth tests. I understand not wanting to be too crunchy, but that's a pendulum that swings both ways. Overall, though, I'd give Overlight a stamp of recommended. This is with the asterisk that if your background leans more into the likes of more granular games like D&D, regardless of edition, I would not recommend this. It's better suited for those who have a more narrativist background, such as Fate, Powered by the Apocalypse, or most especially, Exalted. Just be aware that there's probably going to be a bit of house ruling to make some parts work. Even beyond that, I love the Gonzo fantasy aesthetic that Overlight presents, especially with the emphasis on a layered world. It's just one with a slightly higher floor and requires people to take a different approach at fantasy. Stay frosty!